respond to, uh, to both of you in terms of uh, tr trying to ask questions and, and provide her observations, and then we'll open it up for questions and comments from the audience, if that's okay. Sounds good. I'm going to take a little more than 30 minutes. Uh, I thought that we had the two hours, but uh, I think we can do it in like 40 minutes or something. 40 like minutes that. is fine. Sure. No problem. Let's do it 40 minutes. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's perfect. Um, and, and, then, uh, and then we can... Uh, so why don't we... Uh, uh, Lily, how are we doing uh, in terms of uh, hosting, co-hosting? Everyone is co-hosting already. Okay. Of the speakers, including you. Wonderful. So, um, so now Kobe and Katrina, as we wait uh, two more minutes for uh, uh, six oh five, which is you know this is the, the the five minutes that we wait for for those to join us, uh, we should have an AI to assist us with the fourth elections, right? We should uh, we should design a system that can can help vote for us, uh, predict the voting and correct the mistakes of the of the of people for us right well i think the current situation is miserable and, and making machines vote for people will make it even worse sure <laughs> <laughs> at least in the united states there was some correction and one may wonder what's going to happen in israel to which direction we are going to correct if at all <laughs> Yes. Okay, so I think that uh, I think that we are we're uh, ready to start. So it is a, it is a great uh, pleasure to formally open the um, Christmas Eve meeting of the uh, of the Cyber Forum. Um, it is a pleasure to uh, host here Kobe Nissim from Georgetown University and Kantrida Liget from uh, Hebrew University, who is who's affiliated also with our sister center, the Federman Center uh, for uh, Cybersecurity Research, which is our sister center in Jerusalem. Um, we're going to address something that is very topical. We're going to talk about uh, co-ops. Uh, data co-ops and then other forms of co-ops and the idea I just I'm just going to give the the framework we see that there are challenges related to the uh, digit digital environment when it comes to concentration of power and money um, and then and then we're going to talk uh, then if at Solel who is a PhD student in in our uh, uh, university is going to give a perspective that is theoretical, but also related to action because she's also engaged with people who actually do that. And then uh, Professor Michal Gal, uh, who heads the Law and Technology, uh, the Center for Law and Technology in Haifa, and who is also an expert in law and technology and antitrust law and competition law, will provide her angle on this important uh, issue. And of course, specifically for us, because the cosmos is very considerate, uh, the whole notion of what do we do with the five giants is now percolating in the United States and beyond. Of course, they did it just for us for this uh, cyber forum, and, and we should thank them for that. But the question is, as we know, there are lawsuits in the United States. In, uh, 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 there are issues at the federal system, there are issues in the state, issues in the state system, and also in Europe, and of course also in Israel, with respect of whether we should break uh, or somehow disentangle the concentration of, of data, uh, data, money, and power uh, uh, within those five giants, and if so, how to do it. This model uh, uh, highlights the idea of a co-op, highlights a potential alternative, whether it is an alternative or not, and if so, what should we worry about, and how should we think about, that's part of the, the things we want to discuss. And without further ado, I pass the baton to Kobe and Katrina, please, the floor is yours. Uh, please uh, lead the discussion. Okay, thanks, Amnon. And we're going to share this presentation um, between us. And what you said is a perfect introduction to our, uh, uh, to our presentation. And we'd like to thank you and the forum for inviting us uh, to give this session. And I just remember today that I think exactly a year ago, just before Christmas, I gave a talk in your 
from that time it was in person in Haifa and hopefully next time it also will be like that. So let me uh, begin. Let me tell you a little about us. Uh, me and Katrina were both theoretical computer scientists. This means that our work is mathematical in nature. We make theorems then and claim, and then we try to prove them mathematically rigorously as you did like in, in maybe in geometry class in high school. Um, and our specific background is in cryptography, differential privacy and game theory. And you'll see that this also affects our agenda, research agenda in this project. And we've been developing algorithmic tools for addressing issues of privacy and fairness and computation over uh, the last more than a decade. Uh, in the last few years, we started thinking about the data ecosystem and we're thinking about its strengths, but also its weaknesses and how individual data is being used in these systems and how uh, vulnerabilities are created by this uh, uh, usage. We're now working towards developing tools that can help improve the data ecosystem. And this is what we'll uh, talk about today. And we're assembling a group of researchers to work on these issues under the title of Data Co-ops. And today's uh, talk is part of our pitch for this project and for some of the research directions that we are interested in. And let me also mention that the Data Co-ops project is supported in part by a gift to Georgetown University and uh, joint collaborators on this project are Elizabeth Edenberg from CUNY, who's uh, an ethicist, many thinkers from Bailan University, and who's a cryptographer, and Alex Wood from Harvard, who is a legal Harvard, who's a legal scholar. Okay, so uh, we're all aware that uh, we, we live with a complex data system, and this is, has sprouted um, over the, uh, uh, the past couple of decades. And much of the data is collected about individuals. Uh, it has fueled a lot of innovations. Many aspects of our lives are, are affected by that. Uh, it uh, enables experiences and services that we could only dream of a couple of decades before. Uh, and in 2017, an article of The Economist confirmed that data had become the world's most valuable resource, beating oil. And um, definitely we know that Data About Us has become a multi-billion dollar business. And the data ecosystem is extremely complex and it's mostly opaque to most of us. We, like I'm sure you've seen this kind of uh, uh, slides illustrating the data ecosystem. And this is from a few years ago. Uh, it gets more complex and more dense every passing year. And the ways in which personal data is gathered, stored, processed, and used as the basis of a wide variety of decisions and actions uh, are complex. Or, and even um, an expert uh, finds it hard to understand what is going on. Many of these decisions go way beyond being simply technical or even economic. And I want to emphasize that these are decisions of legal nature and legal consequences that are made by technical systems and, by, and, and, and which were developed by uh, mostly uh, programmers and, and computer scientists. The most obvious, obvious ones are decisions which affect credit score or mortgage decisions and bail decisions but there are also less obvious ones, like even a showing of ads for commercial purposes can discriminate, strengthen biases, can lead to radicalization, social fragmentation. And these are things that we're seeing in the last few years very prominently. And any summary of the current ecosystem is guaranteed to lose most of the details. And we're going to take um, uh, to an extreme, uh, we're going to take our summary into extreme by introducing a cartoon of the data ecosystem. And we are going to use this cartoon throughout uh, today's talk. So this is our, sorry, this is our cartoon. And for today's talk, we're going to pare the ecosystem down to, to, to this very simple picture. And let me first tell you uh, why, what this caricature says, and then we'll take a little tour of some of the more disturbing effects and risks that this system entails, okay? And after that, we'll take a look at a number of ways in which recent technological and legal innovations could be deployed 
and to revise this ecosystem and which pieces of the problem they could help solve. Uh, but we'll of course see that there are some gaping holes that remain even though we have these technologies and these legal tools. The piece of the data uh, ecosystem that we're focusing on is a system where data about uh, many individuals is gathered in order to, uh, to surface correlations, trends, patterns, and even, cause, even causal effects. And those global observations are then deployed in the service of personalization and personalizing the experience of future individuals, okay? Individuals that not necessarily contributed their data into the system. Um, these individuals will receive personalized recommendations. They will get different opportunities. They'll have payload prices and basically a personalized worldview. Okay, on the left hand side of this picture, we see the gathering of personal information where companies are collecting every detail that they can uh, about our behavior and preferences down to the split second when your attention is going, uh, uh, where your attention is going, where you're physically going and who are you interacting with and what you're buying. And you name it, every kind of information about you. That data is used in providing ever more refined personalization, prediction and recommendation algorithms. What we see on the right of this picture is how such a recommendation algorithm is being deployed on the data of a specific user in order to offer this user a product or job opportunity, news item, political ad, mortgage, life partner, almost everything. And in order to understand that this ecosystem, it's all worth, worth asking why it is done this way. Why is it structured this way? And why do companies care about giving you good recommendations? Why are these entities sucking up tons of information about us? Okay. And there are several answers to this. So uh, sometimes you pay for the services. You are interested in the content, in the personalized content, which is tailored to your preferences and needs. But more often, these companies are using your information to improve services to others, not to you. And these are often their uh, the ad advertisers. This gives the companies competitive edge and they make more money off of you if you click on an ad, okay? So better tailoring content makes you uh, spend more time on a service where they, know, where they show ads so they can show you more ads. Much of the content you receive is really just ads, even if it's in disguise. And again, the ones that make the most money, uh, uh, the, the ads are the ones that make the most money, uh, those that make the most money off of you, okay? And furthermore, stockpiling of data might uh, be useful in the future. This data is usually anonymized, I will say, in, in quotation marks or aggregated, again, quotation marks to be expected from, uh, to be accepted from privacy regulation. Although I should say in a parenthetical statement that there is a growing litany of how this anonymization, this anonymization or aggregation fails to actually hide the individual information. It does not really provide privacy. And this aggregated data is a valuable product by itself. This is the new oil. It can be sold to others to be combined with other data and be used for many purposes from showing you ads to uh, national security. Okay, so the bottom line is that this infrastructure has evolved as a finely tuned machine for capturing as much as, uh, of your time, attention and money as possible. And the internet has gotten good at reading your mind and anticipating your, your every need, not because doing so is a powerful money, uh, sorry, because doing so is a powerful money maker. Uh, sometimes it also serves your interests. So data has evolved into something new. And over a period of about 15 years, we got used to the fact that our detailed personal data can be aggregated and mined for the creation of commercial value. And with applications constantly executing on our cellular phones, IoT devices, and wearables, we have moved to a continuous, anytime, anywhere collection of data. 
uh, to what is fine-grained surveillance. Furthermore, the personal data became so rich, uh, we can long, no longer to pretend that my data is actually mine and that it is relevant only to or primarily to me. There are obvious examples like the photo that I took may have other people in it. My genomic data is also about my relatives. My contacts are also about them. And there is a less obvious reality that the data ecosystem that we built um, is also drawing sweeping inferences. So my data uh, and the collective data plays part in drawing inferences in predictions about you, not only about me. And this is an essential part of this system. I now, the see. side effect. So, should that... I take over here? Sorry. Sure. Should, where should I take over? Should I take over here? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, sorry, did I get into your part? I think, I so. think so. It's okay. Yeah, Either so, way. now you, you take over. <laughs> so, Happy to over wherever. No worries. Okay. I was in, 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 a, in a run, I guess. <laughs> Let's continue. Sure. Okay, so the next slide. Okay. So sort of a side effect of sort of this, this new ecosystem and the way it's developed is that we've essentially built this million, multi-billion dollar industry um, that is come to rely on having access to these rich profiles about each of us and these rich profiles that are being continuously updated and assembled. And, and those rich profiles that contain all of this incredibly personal information. So we all know what's in there, the browsing behavior, the shopping habits, but also the social relationships, health information, um, sexual orientation, finances, mental health, religious beliefs, political orientation, all sorts of information. Some of it directly uh, exists, exists, some of it uh, more inferred from information that's been gathered about us. And this system effectively gives just a handful of entities who control these rich stores of data enormous power. Um, but as we know, nobody elected them to these roles of power. Um, we didn't pick them in any way because they reflect the diversity of humanity. They don't necessarily have our best interests at heart. And certainly we as ordinary people don't participate um, directly in their design and their governance and their oversight. Um, and meanwhile, the fact that all of this rich data is siloed away in the hands of a few means that we collectively are unable to unlock its full potential uh, to, be to benefit society. Um, so, so we have sort of this amazing resource um, and it's being used not necessarily in our best interests. Next. So, okay, so let's, with that in mind, return to our caricature. Um, so we've already seen a couple of concerns about the ecosystem emerge in our discussion so far. This concerns about concentration of power and siloing of data power and the right to decide how that data power is deployed. Um, but those aren't the only things that can go wrong with this ecosystem. Um, in recent years, a fair amount of attention has been paid to the things that can go wrong due to all of this sort of widespread da data gathering that the system entails. All those black arrows on the left-hand side that are scooping up data from all of us all of the time. And to a certain extent, the, the little orange arrow that's gathering data in order to issue a recommendation on the right-hand side of the slide there. And in reality, those two arrows aren't really all that separate. So for the rest of the talk, we're gonna um, introduce a metaphor to help us sort of organize um, how we think about these informational harms from the data ecosystem. And the metaphor that we use is to distinguish between harms that originate in information coming from me, and we'll call that the outgoing edge, the edge going out of me, information coming from me, and those risks that are more related to information and services that are being provided to me sort of in the process of tailoring information and services and opportunities to my profile. And we call those incoming things, the incoming edge. So we're gonna use that metaphor to help us organize thinking about the, the risks in this space. So let's focus first on that outgoing edge. Um, 
this is the edge that probably um, people are a bit more familiar with. We all have thought a bit about what can go wrong when data gets into the wrong hands or gets misused. Um, things including embarrassment, increased insurance premiums, loss of access to services or rights or mobility, rejection of a job application, losing a job, blackmail, coercion, arrest, bodily harm. And these harms, of course, affect not just the person who's directly being harmed and directly involved, but also the toxic effects of living in a society in which these risks hang over us and over our neighbors. Uh, because where our data goes once it enters the ecosystem is so opaque, in some sense, it doesn't matter how much you trust the company you initially engage with. The harms and risks of this sort accumulate as your data and its derivatives spread through the system in various forms into the hands of dozens and hundreds of entities you've never heard of, like on that second slide, um, and with whom you don't even have any necessarily established relationship. Um, often, at least in my experience, I learn about these companies only when I get a data breach notice, which is required in the US. Um, so this is a routine uh, piece of mail that I get these days about my data being stolen from some company, usually a company that I have never even heard of and didn't even know I had a relationship with. Um, it's often, you know, such serious data that I really don't want out there. And so, so it's natural given these substantial risks and concerns that we see a lot of work both technological and legal that's been going into thinking about how to reduce and mitigate those outgoing edge harms. Um, so we'll talk about this in more detail in a moment, but this is where you hear words sort of like privacy and control and data deletion and the whole sort of vocabulary of, of tools and, and techniques. And we'll talk about that more shortly. Um, I also wanna highlight that the concerns about the, the outgoing edge um, are not just individual concerns. Um, there's the reality that surveillance tends to have a pretty sort of chilling effect on things like free speech, political organizing, um, just generally makes for a pretty creepy reality. And I also want to highlight that we see particular potential for amplified harms along this outgoing edge to those who are already in disadvantaged groups. Um, so if you're already vulnerable, if you're already a minority, if you're already poor, um, you're more at risk uh, for some of, to some of these harms. Okay, next slide. Okay, so in the next couple of slides, what we're going to do um, is we're going to continue with this uh, sort of running example, this caricature of how does machine learning work in order to create an algorithm that can give very accurate, very tailored recommendations. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a, a sequence of technological interventions that attempt to resolve some of the problems um, that we see with this caricature of the, of the system. Um, and I want to simultaneously point out that amazing and miraculous developments have occurred over the past decade or so um, in the tech space, allowing us to really substantially revise some of these harms in the system. Um, and I really want to point out the, you know, how amazing some of this work is. But I also want to keep in mind through now and, and throughout that these technologies do not completely solve the problem. And the next step is going to be to talk about, in particular, the pieces of the problem that are really not well addressed by, by the current toolkit. Okay, so the first technological intervention that I want to talk about um, goes under the name of secure multi-party computation, um, or MPC or SMPC. You might see those acronyms floating around. And the idea here is to revise the trust model that's involved. So in this sort of first version um, that we saw of this, uh, of this caricature, everybody there on the left in some sense had to pass over this very sensitive data to the central authority, the Google or the Facebook or the whoever was in the middle there. And they had to give all that sensitive data and they had to trust that that central authority was going to compute what they were supposed to compute. They were going to train a machine learning algorithm um, and they were going to compute anything else. Um, and they were actually going to sort of do what, what they had promised to do. And what the secure multi-party computation toolkit does for us is it eliminates the need for individuals 
to share in this centralized way. And it replaces that centralized sharing and computation um, and that trust that they're gonna behave well with a much weaker trust assumption. Instead, we are going to be sharing pieces of information that essentially look like garbage um, with each to, with each of a number of different entities. So you say, instead of having one central entity, maybe we have three or maybe we have five entities. Um, we're gonna share pieces that individually look like garbage with each of them. And they together are going to be able to carry out the computation and get the correct answer. Um, but they don't learn anything else and nobody learns anything else beyond sort of correctly computing what they were supposed to compute or correctly training the machine learning algorithm as they were supposed to, unless there's a sort of severe violation of trust. So instead of, you know, one party being untrustworthy, for example, the majority of these parties would have to collude and be untrustworthy and not do what they were supposed to do as part of the computation in order for more information to be revealed. So you should think of this as a toolkit that basically replaces any situation where you would normally have to trust one central authority, replacing that with a much weaker trust model, which is amazing. Um, and this is a toolkit that is uh, started to come to uh, the point of being sort of uh, practically deployable. Uh, and we're seeing more and more actual deployments and implementations of ideas of this sort. So that's amazing. I wanna point out though that it doesn't solve all the problems here. Um, if you were previously computing something um, where the result of the computation was leaking sensitive information about individuals, then even the secure multi-party computation version of that computation is also going to leak that information. Similarly, if that computation had some other desi undesirable effect, um, such as discrimination against a minority group, the secure multi-party computation version of the computation is also going to have that undesirable effect. Um, so it's important to point out that decentralization, while it's potentially really uh, powerful, and it, decentralization alone doesn't give individuals negotiating power. It doesn't necessarily expand the set of socially beneficial, beneficial computations that can be or will be performed on data, but it does potentially sort of take apart one piece of the set of problems that we have here. Okay. Next, the next technology that I want to talk about, again, something that's really blossomed over the past sort of decade plus, um, is the notion of differential privacy, um, of which I, Kobe is a co-inventor. Um, differential privacy is a notion of privacy that provides a way of designing analyses whose outcome doesn't reveal any specific individual's information. Um, so you can still carry out sort of aggregate computations. You can still train machine learning algorithms. You can do, still do statistics on large data sets, um, but you, you can do them in a way that provably, mathematically, you know, formally, I, where the results don't leak information about individuals. And intuitively, the way that this is happening is that there's some sort of noise that's being introduced at some point in the process. Um, and there are a number of ways to achieve this requirement of differential privacy, that the results of your computation not be too revealing. Um, one way to achieve this type of guarantee um, involves adding the noise right sort of at the source of the data. So instead of handing over your sensitive data to a company for them to, to do their machine learning, um, each individual phone could add noise to the data before passing it along. And that's what that sort of fuzz on the arrow is supposed to uh, symbolize. And so that gives very, very strong and desirable protections to the people who are handing over their data. And intuitively what, what can happen is even if each of us adds so much noise that our data kind of looks like garbage uh, to the company individually, because they're gathering data from so many phones, they can still see the aggregate trends. So despite the fact that my data looks like garbage and your data looks like garbage, because there are a million of us, uh, together, Google can still uh, train a good machine learning algorithm on it, for example. Another uh, model uh, of achieving differential privacy involves adding noise to the computation itself. 
So we still hand over in this model, we would still hand over uh, sensitive data and we would entrust the company instead of carrying out the computation directly to do some form of noising of the computation so that the results that uh, come out, for example, this train recommendation algorithm that comes out on the right hand side, provably doesn't sort of encode our personal data. And you might think that's sort of a strange thing to be worried about. Why would I worry that you know Google's recommendation algorithms, the algorithm, why would I worry that the algorithm somehow encodes the training data? But it turns out that this is something that actually routinely happens these days in machine learning. Um, we train algorithms, we sort of learn patterns um, on what we call training data. And what's been happening um, and sort of been noticed more and more in recent years um, with these sophisticated machine learning algorithms is that they have a tendency to actually encode or remember their training data. And if you, you know how to sort of poke them in the right clever way, um, they, they can spit that training data back out. Um, so it is, it's a, sounds like a crazy thing to be worried about, but it's actually a very, very real concern. Um, so again, we have this toolkit now, this vocabulary of differential privacy um, for mitigating all of these concerns and protecting personal information in this way. Um, again, though, I, despite sort of the, the richness and the fact that this is, again, a technology that's really come to deployment in recent years, uh, the US Census, for example, has I stated that all releases of the 2020 census will be subject to differential privacy. Apple's using it on the iPhone, Google's used it in Chrome. It's, you know, this is, you know, a, a powerful technology that's really come into use. Again, it doesn't so solve all the problems. And then the third sort of cluster of technologies that I wanted to uh, draw some attention to, again, amazing uh, possibilities here, address more of the concerns that are occurring on that right-hand side of the caricature. So what's going on on the right-hand side of the caricature, that's where we're actually deploying the recommendation algorithm. So the left-hand side was where we were training the algorithm, where we were learning the patterns. On the right-hand side, we're actually getting somebody's data in order to recommend a movie for them to watch or a you know news item for them to read or a product to buy or a life partner to date. And the concern there is it would seem naturally in order for Netflix to tell me what movie uh, to watch next, I would have to tell Netflix what movies I've watched in the past and whether I liked them or not. That seems like it would be a natural requirement. And the types of technologies that I wanna talk about now are technologies that actually say, no, I don't have to tell Netflix what I've watched in the past in order to get a good recommendation. And there are a couple of ways in which that can occur. One is instead of me handing my data to Netflix, Netflix could hand me or my device their recommendation algorithm and my phone could generate the recommendation on its own. And so that's um, intuitively one of the things that can happen. Another possibility um, that can happen uh, that goes under the, the term uh, fully homomorphic encryption is the idea that I can noise my data hand it over to the Netflix of the world. They can compute on this data, which to them looks like total garbage, get out a recommendation from their algorithm, which to them looks like total garbage. And they can hand that back to my device, which can be decrypted on my device to yield a good recommendation. So from Netflix's point of view, they've seen garbage come in and garbage come out. It doesn't mean anything to them. But from my perspective, I get the good recommendation. Um, so again, these, uh, these are ideas that have really, over the past decade plus, started to potentially become feasible to implement. Um, really exciting. Again, sort of addresses a piece of the problem, but not everything. And then, of course, we've also simultaneously, over the past decade or so, seen huge steps and in innovations being taken in the regulatory legal space. Um, including new regulations in Europe and the US, in particular California, we've seen a lot of action. Um, and this, since this is not my area of expertise, I'll just talk very briefly about the um, types of interventions we've seen recently. Um, from my perspective, a lot of what I understand to be sort of the new legal tools in this space uh, take the form of a toolkit for providing more control of data flow. 
things like which information can be collected, under what restrictions, providing individuals with some limited degree of transparency as to which data about them is being collected, formalizing data obligations and how they would pass from one entity to another as data passes from one entity to another, limiting data retention, so on and so forth. Um, ideally, we can also think about legal tools to impose more detailed restrictions on how and when data can be shared um, and to require the use of algorithms that satisfy certain fairness or privacy requirements. Um, but it's important to point out that at least so far, there have been really large gaps between the language that we see appearing in legal requirements and the technical language. And that has resulted in a lot of sort of gray areas and loopholes and situations where the law sometimes seems to require something that isn't even technologically meaningful or feasible. Um, and so this calls really for work into bridging between these two languages and toolkits. And that's, I think, really crucial to, to making progress in this space. But despite, next slide, um, despite all of this progress, um, both on the sort of regulatory side and on the tech side over the past decade or so, um, we still haven't solved all the problems of the data ecosystem. Even if we take the most optimistic view and sort of combine together all the best of all of these technologies and all the best of these legal interventions, um, there's still some major problems that remain. So let's return to this caricature and think a little bit about what's addressed and what's not. And it helps to, I think, to remember at this point what Kobe was saying at the beginning, that co companies aren't looking over our shoulders and enabling others to do so just because they have voyeuristic tendencies. They're doing it to make money. Let's remember how they're making money. They're making money by knowing us and our interests better, by capturing our attention better, and by shaping our behavior better. And here where all of that capturing and shaping is going on on the right hand side and the sort of personalization uh, side of things, that's, that's where our data is, uh, is being used to sort of shape our experiences. And this involves some harms that tend to get historically less attention than those uh, harms related to data collection, but I think they're no less concerning. And it's important to, to state up front that none of those cool technologies that I just surveyed puts any restriction really on this incoming edge. Um, so neither the legal tools nor the, the tech tools that we've talked about so far are really in a position to intervene to provide for, to protection from concerns such as say discrimination or manipulation. Okay, so what's, what's going on in the incoming edge? Um, well, because of the financial in incentives that we talked about at the beginning, platforms with all of this data power that they've accumulated have grown into these extremely sophisticated tools for shaping our thoughts, our interests, our desires, and our actions. That already sounds creepy. Um, and they and their clients influence how we spend our money, who we date and marry, what we read, even our perceptions of reality. Um, and platforms have really developed this incredibly refined ability to provide us with differentiated information, different opportunities, different experiences, prices, services, based on our personal prof profiles. Um, but there's a real concern that this can devolve into discrimination. And there's a risk that personalization would emphasize social division, social biases. Um, and so also there's this concern that this tool for shaping our behavior could turn out to be uh, used for manipulation. And again, I wanna emphasize that these are not just concerns of the individual, just the fact that you know, someone's looking over my shoulder or manipulating me. Yes, that's very concerned at the, concerning at the individual level, but I think even more profoundly, I, it's really threatening to sort of the fundamental workings of democracy and other aspects of our society. It's important to bear in mind that you can't protect yourself from these incoming edge harms by withholding your data or controlling the flow of data. So it's tempting when we hear about data harms to think sort of lock it down, control it, that's gonna solve the problem, but it really isn't here uh, because inferences will still be drawn about you even if you try to withhold your data. They'll be drawn about you on the basis of everyone else's data and those inferences can potentially replicate basically all of these data harms that we're talking about now. 
Um, and one way to return to this data as the new oil metaphor is to say that the, the data from the people around you and even from people around the globe who you've never even met, that data spill is polluting your water too. And it's far from obvious what we can or should do given the tools that we have. Okay, so again, this caricature, I wanna remind you that it's only a caricature, it's only a piece of the data ecosystem, but I think it already captures a lot of what's going on here and a lot of the harms to be concerned about. Um, and against this backdrop, um, it's important to point out that a, while it's clear that we still need more and better protection for the data, which is sort of the traditional view in some sense of, of data concerns, um, you know, we need better privacy, security, access control, usage limitation, retention policies, tools for data providence, so on and so forth. But I think there's this emergent view that we don't just need to be protected, protecting the data, we also need protection from the data to help us deal with these issues of surveillance, discrimination, fairness, political manipulation, social fragmentation. And there is exciting emerging technical work that's going on on some of these problems, particularly in the area of algorithmic fairness, but we need more. And even again, taking this sort of most optimistic view and putting together all of the, you know, all of the best tools and even looking at the trajectories of all of the, the work that's going on in this space, um, we're not on a trajectory to address the major societal harms here, the erosion of trust in self and others and government and science and this troubling reality that a small number of tech companies get to decide on the social discourse and on profound societal issues such as what constitutes acceptable discrimination and who should be allowed to be susceptible to what types of manipulation. And I think it's important um, to be upfront about the fact that without intending any sort of harm, both law and computer science communities uh, carry responsibility for where we are in terms of the status quo. Um, computer science has developed the technology that's enabled the current data ecosystem, too often believing that technology is value neutral. Um, this perspective is slowly changing. Um, and simultaneously, policy has allowed this technology to be used and hasn't adapted quickly enough to the sort of changing threats and changing tools to address those threats. Um, so it's very clear that both of these fields are in some sense complicit, um, but both of these fields are really crucially going to be key in addressing the problems of the data ecosystem. And it, it's, it's going to be crucial, not just that sort of each of these toolkits be uh, developed and uh, refined, but it's clear that these toolkits need to be built to work together in a meaningful way. Um, and there's really a pressing need to develop bridges between the disciplines to identify joint goals, formalize definitions, um, de develop sort of paradigms that communicate with each other. Um, and these will be the foundations for a strong and meaningful discussion. So I hope we've convinced you that we can't just leave the data ecosystem as is, um, or if we are, we're, we're accepting the path that we're on and embracing it. Um, we hope that there's a better way. And so now Kobe is gonna tell you briefly about this research project that we've been involved in that's trying to contribute to the effort of rethinking the data ecosystem. Um, and as he mentioned, this is joint work with Elizabeth and with Benny and Alex. Yeah, so now, um... I don't think we have that much time, so I'll yeah, try to go uh, quickly and maybe skip a few uh, slides in describing this project. But we view uh, data co-ops as a layer in the user platform interaction. And we are thinking about introducing a collection of interventions in uh, this interaction. Um, we can, uh, some of them are, are on the outgoing edge, some of them are on the incoming edge, on the out outgoing edge, we're thinking about data co-ops as a way to control and minimize the flow of data. Um, and hopefully the data co-op will have enough cloud to affect a, a change in this, in this sense. Data is all, uh, only valuable in the collective sense. So uh, users have to come together in order to gain, uh, to gain some negotiation power. Um, the data co-op can insist on carrying out computations by itself, um, maybe subject to tools like differential privacy, 
uh, it can itself be decentralized and so on. On the income edge, we think about the data co-ops as um, establishing standards for acceptable personalization um, as uh, a, a tool for um, making sure that uh, standards are not violated for services that are delivered to in, uh, individuals. And with um, uh, having like a global view of the data ecosystem, what, which any, us, any of us as individuals we don't have, uh, a data co-op can perhaps detect uh, what would be otherwise uh, undetectable violations. And we're not thinking about a specific form of a data co-op. Doesn't necessarily have to be one entity. Maybe it's a collection of entities or a collection of interventions. And this is part of our uh, uh, research is to understand exactly what are good shapes for these kind of interventions. Now, the idea of introducing intermediaries is not new. And looking at the uh, short history of the internet, we can find a, already in the late 90s, um, uh, Hegel and Singer write about intermediaries. For, for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, just uh, fly by over this. And, um, and, and there has been the first wave in the early 2000s but that was uh, crushed by the dot-com crash, cut by the dot-com crash. There's an interesting uh, thesis uh, of Bethany Lightly describing some of the reasons for, for this, and, and these were mainly economic concerns at that time. Then there was a second wave, and this was uh, strangled by technological uh, challenges. And again, an interesting paper describing this uh, from 2012. And we see a current third uh, wave where uh, if you look around, you see a lot of uh, 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 new uh, projects and, 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 and new startups around ideas that are related to what we would think is a co-op co idea. Okay, so what has changed in uh, this year is and like, do we, are we in a better shape than in 2012 to uh, the, develop their co-ops? So one thing that is clear is that the program, uh, the problem grew very significantly and we cannot ignore it anymore. We do have to deal with it. And also on the positive side, as Katrina mentioned, we have a lot of new technologies that have, are, are in a better and mature, more mature uh, uh, state than they were a decade ago. And, and many of them are just making uh, significant first steps into our real world applications. Some of them are actually modern uh, first steps. This include uh, these technologies that we have uh, uh, on the slide and more. And we also have uh, evolved and more mature, uh, uh, I would call it legal technology, legal machinery. And in, in particular, we have the GDPR in the EU and new legislation in California. And all this is an important, important improvement, but as Katrina mentioned, we have still many gaps uh, between uh, the concepts that we deal with uh, with technology and the concepts that are dealt with in uh, the legislation. And we don't really understand how um, they work together in, in, a very, um, uh, in a very deep way. So we believe that um, there is a new, uh, that we have an exciting challenge on filling the holes in this picture. Uh, or bridging between legal tools and technical tools to ensure that they complement and support one another and uh, to bring this various piece of future uh, of a future data co-op into being. And our project is, is, is a research project. It, uh, we have identified a, a, a large collection, sorry about this, of uh, research agendas and many questions within each of these research agenda. So there's plenty of work to do on technical theoretical foundations, such as building new techniques to carry out crucial computations in a distributed and privacy preserving fashion. And there's interesting work to be done in designing technically how all the pieces will fit together. 
And uh, co-op raised numerous interesting questions in the realm of governance, including issues about how co-ops interactions with other entities would be governed and the internal governance structure of a data co-op. And given the enormous, enormous value of data, it's not surprising that co-ops also raise economic questions, including setting proper incentives for participants in the new data ecosystem and new techniques for understanding the value of data. Definitely there is room here for uh, and, uh, and building uh, for new ideas about data markets. And some of the most exciting challenges lie in bridging between disciplines, uh, build components that work together and that can achieve their goals in the real world. Now, part of why we feel that co-ops need attention from academia, and this is another focus of our uh, group, is because this brand new entity introduces new risks and developers uh, uh, of uh, the co-ops like ideas uh, can uh, are usually more oriented towards implementation and, and they may not have the inclination or the luxury to deeply and constantly dig into uh, these risks that, that uh, this potential risk but it's crucial to be alert to the unintended consequences that any revision to the data ecosystem could have and if we have learned a lesson about technology in the last 20 years, this is the lesson. In the case of co-ops, they could potentially be subjected to existing threats such as hacking or subpoena, and without sufficient controls in place, they could re replicate existing data harms. And furthermore, we must keep an eye to make sure that co-ops co could not turn bad over time, and even how they might amplify existing disparities in societies. Okay, so there are a lot of things to look at here. So before uh, uh, we conclude, let me show you a schematic view of, of our project. Uh, we're combining a top-down approach. This is what you see on the left with a bottom-up approach. And we're trying to follow both of them at the same time. The top-down approach, we're identifying principles for the development of their co-ops. And currently we're looking at three big questions and we want to understand the different forms of uh, decentralization and how this can take role in the data, in the data ecosystem. Um, and we uh, ask how their cops can intervene in securing the outgoing edge and the protection of information collected from individuals, but also how their cops can intervene on the incoming edge. Now, on the bottom-up approach, which is more uh, technical at this stage, we're looking at the collection of technical interventions, what you see on the uh, right side of the uh, slide, uh, privacy, statistical validity, economic value are some of the questions that we're asking. This is a partial list and it will probably grow as we uh, make progress. And the third and very important part of the research is in bridging between the technology and law and ethics. And in this vein, we're currently working on establishing technical meaning to privacy concepts which appear in privacy law. In my previous visit uh, to your center, I spoke about one of these works. Uh, we're translating technical concepts to language which is hopefully more accessible to non-technical audience. So legal scholars can hopefully use these documents and when they try to understand what technology is, uh, is giving us. And we're giving uh, technical feedback on draft legislation, uh, which is some work that is currently done in California uh, to help, help make sure that this draft legislation agrees with the realities of how data is actually being used and the realities of uh, our current understanding in uh, privacy science and data science. So uh, let me just uh, conclude with this. Uh, Despite, despite the risks, we think that uh, this is a direction in which we must proceed, uh, both academia and uh, other entities. Uh, the time is ripe for rethinking of the data ecosystem and we're at the threshold of the technical feasibility for many of the necessary components. And we hope that this progress, the progress in this direction will help lead us to a new uh, and better future in the use of data. So I'm just going to conclude. Uh, actually, let me leave you with this slide. And I think this is where we'll end.
Perfect. Thank you very much, Katrina and Kobe, for this uh, wonderful presentation, rich technologically, legally, socially, economically. And without further ado, Ifat, the uh, floor is yours to bring us a perspective of theory and action, please. If I had a feeling microphone. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I'm on. Um, well, I'm, I should say, I'm, I'm, as, you, as you already mentioned, I, I'm, I also, I, I both uh, research the subject of uh, well, cooperatives or, or economic democracy and practicing it uh, just uh, at the midst of, uh, of uh, a week of social businesses and cooperatives of the Jerusalem municipality and uh, in the middle of many, many events of this week. And um, I wasn't exactly sure what would be the, um, uh, how this uh, event is going to look like and what exactly I should talk about really. So um, there's this paper that I, I did publish, I think it was a, a year ago or maybe more than a year ago that we've been discussing with Michal in the past. Um, uh, which uh, actually deals with um, with uh, um, well the platform economy and uh, how to describe it, and uh, with the concept of of platform uh, cooperatives, um, and I think maybe we'll, I'll, I'll go back to this uh, paper and then uh, uh, go uh, a bit further than that. Um, so let me um, try to share. Uh, screen um, okay. do you see that can you see that okay good um so i uh, will start with the with a paper uh which really tries to uh understand how the platform economy uh looks like um um, right. um, just a second. Okay. So what I'm, um, from my uh, uh, theoretical perspective is of democracy. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of, of, uh, of democracy and of economic democracy as the basics of, uh, um, oh, let me put it otherwise. Uh, think of democracy and uh, not only in the political uh, uh, side of it. Um, Let's see, just a second. Okay, now I can see what I'm supposed to read. Um, I think that when we consider democracy only on political aspects, um, especially these days, uh, even more than ever before, uh, a huge part of our lives is handling undemocratically. Uh, so that is, uh, Robert Dahl's things from many, many years ago, that if democracy is justified in governing the state, then it is also justified in governing economic enterprises. And now we're talking about much more than enterprises, because we're talking about the, uh, actually, the whole economic sphere, which is uh, uh, a huge part uh, of, of our lives and is also, of course, very uh, in a large part uh, determines the political life as well. And uh, what I've been trying to do in this paper that I published is to um, uh, show that the, uh, uh, how, how much the economic aspects and specifically in platform e economy uh, interfere with our basic, uh, well, with basic politics, with basic decisions of, uh, of citizens. Um, so I wouldn't want to go into, uh, um, theories of economic democracy, but uh, um, I would try to uh, question uh, 
I mean, to talk about questions of ownership and, and control. Um, and um, they said, economic democracy is seldom discussed as a political goal or as a legal norm. It is uh, usually only discussed as uh, something that is uh, uh, relevant only to the uh, economic sphere. And I think that the fact that they're trying to separate this economic sphere and the, and the political sphere is um, uh, unrealistic uh, in a way. Um, so what I'm trying to talk about is, does uh, a platform uh, economy operate differently than the old economy? And does it strengthen workers' rights or expand exploitation? Does platform economy aggregate corporate dominance or stimulate economic democracy? Um, oh. So I've been describing a case study uh, regarding the operation of, uh, of Uber and Lyft in uh, Austin, Texas, uh, started in 2014. And in 2015, the city uh, council decided to apply safety reporting and accounting requirements uh, regarding the operation of uh, Uber and Lyft in Austin. Um, and they really didn't like it. Uh, and uh, since they couldn't stop the, uh, uh, um, the decision at the, uh, well, the political sphere, they decided to put it into vote. Uh, and they put on uh, what they called Proposition 1, suggested uh, to, to revoke the city council resolution. Um, here again, we see that they've put a lot of money into trying to convince the uh, people of Austin to change the decision of the um, representatives. Uh, it was one of the largest uh, campaigns ever, money-wise, more than uh, $8 million uh, into a campaign to support this proposition. Um, that to show you how they described if uh, they would, wouldn't would allow Uber and Lyft to do whatever they want in Austin, Texas. They, this was one of their commercials saying, we will go back to riding horses. Um, so, um, in 2016, the people of Austin voted no to Proposition 1. They said that they do have to uh, comply, comply with the uh, uh, rules the uh, city council put on, uh, making them uh, add fingerprints for, for the drivers and uh, put into uh, safety requirements. Um, so, what they've described as uh, something that would change the uh, the way the transportation system in uh, Austin would look like, uh, even if they would leave uh, the city. Um, and they actually left the day or two days after uh, the proposition was uh, uh, the, the voting no for the proposition. And it seems that the uh, tech requirements for uh, this kind of platform are not that great. It took only a few weeks for uh, a bunch of, uh, of technician, of, of, of uh, um, software uh, people to write a different uh, platform and to uh, allow all the drivers in Austin who want to use it and to comply with the requirements of the city council to just to use it as a, as a non-profit. Um, so that's right, Austin, it's a non-profit that started operating just a few weeks after Lyft and Uber left uh, Austin, Texas. Um, so it was a private non-profit um, owned by this small uh, group, but uh, used by whoever wanted to use it. Um, the, um, um, the way they operate the system was a bit different. They deducted just uh, the 20% of the, uh, for, for the uh, operation of the, of the platform. Um, the prices were, were fixed um, and uh, there's no 
uh, outside company that makes profits out of the operation of these of these drivers. It all goes to the to the drivers who are a part of the community who are working in their own community. Uh, at the same time, we had uh, ADX, which is a drivers cooperative, uh, who uh, asked for a license to uh, operate a, a, a taxi yeah, a taxi drivers cooperative. It's a workers cooperative um, that, of course, would comply with all the regulations and uh, and more than only the uh, regulations for. Uh, um, um, private drivers because they have to meet all the regulations concerning uh, um, uh, to have the enough uh, uh, taxis that can uh, um, provide service to people with their uh, wheelchairs and uh, of course to meet all the environmental uh, practices that are in the in the city. Um, so that's ADX Co-op. Uh, it's a workers' co-op. Um, the drivers um, um, don't have to pay the company like in other taxi companies. And the prices, of course, don't change or there's high demand. And of course, it meets the regular the uh, regulatory demands. Um, but it didn't end with that because Uber and Lyft uh, decided to try to change the decision, even though they voted, well, actually voted out of the city, and they went, they went to the state senate. And um, the, 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 the state uh, senate of Texas passed a bill that would actually allow them to do whatever they want. Um, they determined that the regulation of transportation um, would only um, be according to the uh, state regulation and the city doesn't have anything to say about it. And um, the, the Texas state legislation, actually it looks like it's been taken out of uh, um, an Uber web page, uh, allowing for the companies to operate as they wish and wouldn't allow the uh, city council to put any other requirements that addition to the state legislation. That's really uh, um, um, compromising the uh, democratic decisions of the state, of the citizens, of the residents of, of Austin. So, um, if I'm going back to the questions I'm trying to look at is does platform economy operate differently than the old economy? Well, of course not. Um, does it strengthen workers' rights? Well, it doesn't. And uh, does plat will platform economy aggregate corporate dominance or stimulate economic democracy? I think the question, the, the answer is it is only a platform and depends what you put in it. Um, so we need to look at platforms as um, the, all, the old uh, questions we used to ask uh, regarding the, what we call the old economy. So it, who owns the resources and who makes the profits and who makes the decisions? Um, as I said, platforms are basic resources these days. It's like land in the grand times and means of production for the industrial after the industrial revolution. It's the same questions as ever before. Um, going back to well, where I come from as a, as, a, as a legal scholar, the question is how we, uh, how we define things. And the, the, the role of law, as I see it in these cases, is to create awareness, words to use to affect the way the reality is conceived and to provide clear tools for policymakers to understand what kind of operation they are looking at. Um, using nice words like sharing economy or any, any, any other uh, terms um, don't necessarily uh, describe reality as it is. So what 
uh, I've tried to classify uh, online economy uh, into um, three dimensions. One is platform capitalism. The other is sharing economy as a third is platform corporatism. Um, so platform capitalism is actually capitalism. It doesn't change anything. So the ownership is of the uh, uh, whoever holds the shares, the profits goes to uh, shareholders. Decisions are of course made by the shareholders. Um, the, uh, 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 the main goal is maximization of profits and the uh, users uh, uh, only role is to, well, use the platform. Um, um, I think that we should uh, reclaim the, the term sharing economy that has been misused by uh, platform uh, capitalism. I think sharing economy is a great idea. Um, it has the ownership, uh, ownership can be uh, of different different kinds, but uh, the, the whole idea of not separating between the economy and the society um, is a great notion. It's, uh, um, it's an authentic notion and it describes how people want to live. But the main problem with what they called sharing economy is that they didn't have the uh, aspect of, of power. They didn't have the aspect of ownership and the aspect of democracy. And this is where we come to, uh, um, to cooperativism. Um, and I think we have talked about uh, cooperatives in uh, um, quite a lot today, but we didn't say what are cooperatives. And I'm not sure everybody, uh, everybody knows. So uh, let me just go uh, uh, back a bit. Um, and uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, it's a bit of a mess, but a cooperative is an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations. So we're jointly owned and democratically, democratically controlled enterprise. This is uh, the definition of the ICA, the International Cooperative Alliance, which is the um, um, international organization of cooperatives. Um, the, uh, uh, um, I think, oldest NGO operating, it's been founded in 1895, and it's the first organization uh, that was uh, uh, decided as a consulting organization to the UN. Um, should say that uh, 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 the ICA has more than 1 billion and 250 uh, million people who are members in cooperatives or members of the ICA. So this is a, a very, very big organization. And um, we know that there are more than 300 million people who get their livelihood out of cooperatives um, that actually get their livelihood from uh, um, a members owned and democratically controlled organization, organizations. 300 million people, uh, that's a larger number than all the people who are employed by transnational companies combined. Um, so uh, when we are, and uh, um, the cooperative movement has seven uh, um, principles uh, that were adopted in uh, um, international law uh, that were uh, uh, adopted by the, by the UN and by the ILO. Um, but I think that uh, um, from our perspective, what is most relevant is really the fact that we are looking at uh, organizations that are owned by members. And when we talk about um, platform economy, they are owned by their users, whomever they are, and are democratically controlled. Um, so, um, let me go back to that. Um, 
So when we talk about uh, platform cooperativism, uh, there's a movement of platform co-ops that has started in the past, I think, five, six years. Um, um, started as an idea of uh, Professor Trevor Schultz from a um, new school in New York. Um, and it started a separate uh, uh, movement, which is uh, growing very, very, very fast. We have more than 400 uh, platform cooperatives now operating around the world. Um, but it's also in uh, close connections with the uh, uh, with the uh, with the ICA, with the International Cooperative Alliance, and I think this is uh, um, one thing that is very uh, important for uh, where this process is headed. Um, because when we only think of the uh, online uh, uh, operation, then we should really think what. Uh, what kind of uh, of businesses we are talking about? I think that when we think of today about platform cooperativism, we think not only about uh, businesses who are operating via uh, platforms, but we also think of democratic mechanisms that are relevant to all kinds of uh, of cooperatives, and and maybe uh, even more interesting regarding uh, old school cooperatives. So if I go back to, um, to the paper um, uh, and to the, uh, to the case uh, I've talked about, uh, after the uh, Texas legislation, Uber and Lyft returned to, to, to Austin, um, the other small private companies who were operating there left but Ride Austin, the nonprofit, and ATX, the cooperative, are still operating, are still operating today and have a large uh, portion of the market. Um, but uh, um, I think that um, the, the, the main, main thing is that uh, the, the way that uh, uh, economic, uh, um, that uh, strong companies try to uh, change uh, or to intervene with uh, um, democratic processes as it was in Austin, Texas, just shows how, uh, um, uh, how much the uh, separation of, uh, of the economy and what is considered the political sphere, which is supposed to be, as I said, separate, it's, it's, just, not the, it's just not the reality. And uh, just uh, going back to what we've heard before, I think that uh, we have now um, the mechanisms, the technological mechanisms that allow for um, uh, different types of organization, of economic organizations to operate in a democratic way in uh, um, uh, magnitude that was never possible before. And the whole concept of uh, economic democracy that was uh, once only relevant for uh, um, small companies, for factories here and there, is now relevant on an international basis. Um, and I would like to show just a few examples of, uh, of uh, platform cooperatives that are working these days and I think are relevant to well, everything we actually deal with. So we have Colab, which is a um, um, high tech people who um, uh, are building platforms and systems for associations, for cooperatives, for platform cooperatives, for regular cooperatives that allow them to uh, um, uh, make decisions collectively uh, to organize the way they operate vis-a-vis -vis clients um, and members, of course, um, and allow for workers cooperatives to be um, well anywhere and they don't have to sit uh, in the same room, they don't have to sit in the same country. Uh, Colab actually, uh, um, the members of Colab sit in different continents and they operate together to build different uh, uh, platforms. Um, Resonate. Resonate is a streaming organization, a streaming cooperative that allows 
uh, musicians to put on uh, to put their music online and to receive a um, fair share of uh, of, uh, of, the, of of what people are paying to listen to and it's a, what we call a multi stakeholders cooperative uh, both the musicians and the listeners are part of the cooperative um, Fair BNB. Fair BNB is a great alternative to Airbnb. If Airbnb was supposed to uh, be a, a, a social organization that allow us to put on uh, our um, house for rent when we go on vacation or the spare room from time to time, and of course we know that it became a, a maximization of profits company that uh, destroy in many places the, uh, uh, how, how, the uh, uh, how, how neighborhoods operate. Um, and we see a lot of restrictions on its operation in many places, not in Israel. Uh, but, it's, um, uh, but the basic idea was great. And uh, uh, so we have Airbnb now in, I think, eight cities. Um, and it grows from uh, grows uh, all the time. We are now thinking of starting uh, um, a branch in Tel Aviv after COVID is uh, would leave us, hopefully soon. Um, ARA is uh, um, artists. Um, well, network actually that operates online that allows uh, artists to run their own business, their art um, uh, galleries or uh, their art business, um, artist collectives and artist cooperatives allow them to uh, uh, to cooperate, to learn from one another. It's uh, an international net that operates online and allows for collaboration and also allows uh, each of us as tourists to find these uh, artists uh, uh, collectives and uh, cooperatives and to and to visit them wherever we visit wherever in the world we are um, um, well that's co-op that's a, a, a co-op cycle which is um, um, like vault, but differently, uh, owned by, of course, the uh, workers. Um, it's a delivery. Uh, it's a delivery co-op. Um, I think that, uh, and if I, I go back for a second to um, to collab, one of the main features of collab is uh, that uh, all the um, all the platforms and uh, all its operation. Uh, um, the data, if we go back to our previous presentation, they don't collect the data of the users. They just don't do it. Uh, they don't need to do it because they don't want to maximize profits on the, uh, of, by using uh, the, the data of the users. Um, so I think that uh, um, we can think of uh, legal restrictions that would never be enough if we want to change the system because the um, uh, um, the, um, the maximization of profits companies would always have the technological um, knowledge and the uh, innovation that would allow them to bypass any restrictions. Um, the only way I think that we can actually deal with these kinds of um, breaches of, uh, of uh, privacy or any other uh, um, huge problems that we have with data and other aspects is by changing the system and allowing for more and more organizations that think differently about the connection between economy and society. Um, I'll just uh, finish with several remarks. So I think the platform economy should not settle for sharing models with good intentions. It should have the power, the strength, the uh, ownership. 
Um, I think we are in the midst of a huge crisis in how we uh, um, conceive democracies. Uh, and during this time of, uh, of COVID-19, uh, this crisis has been, uh, I think, one of the, uh, 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 maybe the worst times to think of, of democracy. There's a huge distrust of people, both in the um, uh, governments and the uh, economic system. We see now on these, on these days, we see many, many, many people who refu refuse to get vaccine because they don't trust the system, they don't trust the government, and they don't trust the, uh, 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 the pharmaceutical companies that uh, uh, provide for these uh, uh, vaccinations. And it actually comes to uh, a place where it affects our, well, lives and deaths. Um, technology has no normative essence and um, platform, uh, platform capitalism's only novelty is the technology. Uh, it can bring exploitation and it can also bring great promise when it, uh, as it can allow for uh, democracy on a huge, huge scale. Um, I think that uh, platform cooperatives uh, should operate both on a local and international levels and it should create the awareness for democratic deficiencies of the market as well as uh, the um, um, the opportunities that uh, will allow for, uh, uh, for, for great changes. Um, so um, what I'm thinking of next is actually how to combine the ideas of uh, platform cooperativism with old school cooperatives. As I've mentioned, we have more than 1 billion and 250 million members of cooperatives all around the world. This is a huge number of people who are participating in, uh, well, in economic democracy processes, but uh, probably most of them are not very much involved with their cooperatives. They, uh, the, the, the big cooperatives are usually cooperative banks or uh, insurance uh, cooperatives. Um, in the US, uh, uh, half of the people who own bank accounts have, bank, have an account in uh, a credit union. Uh, only a very, very small number of those members are participating in any uh, actual uh, economic processes of the credit union. And they definitely don't, uh, uh, um, don't uh, uh, see how the concept of uh, their participation or their uh, um, right to participate in these uh, uh, um, democratic institutions should affect the political uh, agenda or their political lives. And I think that uh, maybe if we will be able to adopt the uh, mechanisms that uh, platform cooperativism uh, allows us or the, the uh, mechanisms that are uh, that we can use these days, not only for the young and interesting and very, very cool initiatives uh, we've discussed, but also the old school cooperatives, the mass members, the mass membered cooperatives, the, the cooperative banks, the insurance cooperatives and others, uh, we can actually change the way uh, the economy behaves and looks like and to uh, actually undermine the separation uh, which is uh, 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 made by uh, um, companies, by maximization, maximization of profit companies that want to operate and to describe the uh, separation as something that makes sense. There is not, nothing that makes sense in separating our economic and a political life and we have now the mechanism that allows for mass members uh, uh, economic democracy like never before and I think um, 
well, anyway, this is what I'm trying to look at. Uh, Thank you. So next uh, research. Thank you very much, Ifat. Uh, time is running short. Thank you for this uh, uh, view on, on the relationship between uh, technology, uh, economy, and, the, and uh, the market. And with that, I turn the floor to Michal, Professor Michal Gal. Please, Michal, the floor is yours. So uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you, um, Kobi and Katrina and Ifat. These were um, wonderful lectures, really interesting. And, um, and I, I, you know, it's in the interest of, of, of all of us for you to succeed <laughs> in your projects. Um, and, and, and so what I'm going to do is, is um, in a way, I'm going to be a bit of a devil's advocate and, uh, and talk about some of the challenges that might arise that have to be uh, that um, um, ha um, have to be taken into consideration. But let me start by saying uh, let, I'm starting with the, the, the paper of uh, Kobe and Katrina. It's a great idea. It's really a wonderful idea, and um, and no doubt uh, the current uh, data ecosystem situation is far from optimal. You've done a great job of. Um, of talking about the multitude of negative effects that it creates. And your idea has merit on many different levels. And I think that from an economic uh, point of view, it solves some of the uh, uh, problems that arise um, uh, uh, in the digital um, economy. Uh, for example, it um, overcomes the rational apathy of data owners or of um, consumers or users because the harm is so small of each of us, uh, or it's so expensive to go after these big firms that it's rational for us to be, uh, um, um, to, to act, um, uh, to not act at all, okay? Or, or spend just uh, small resources. And for the same reason, it also, your solution over, also overcomes what is called in economics, the collective action problem. Uh, uh, which is created when uh, only when to get that together we can achieve things that we cannot achieve uh, um, on our own. It also uh, creates uh, um, power for data owners. Um, a lot has been said about that. And it also creates automation and, um, and, and technological solutions or the uh, um, create a, a higher level of technological solutions for um, protection of some of the values that we value in the digital economy. So the idea is a great one. And the idea of cooperating together, by the way, um, I have a joint paper with Niva Elkin Koren. I don't know if you know it, it's called Algorithmic Consumers. And what we do there is we talk about joint, uh, 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 jointly buying in order to counteract the power of the uh, large sellers and uh, uh, to create, um, uh, to somehow limit price discrimination. So let me, just because, um, you know, I've, I've thought about these issues through uh, our own paper, some of these issues, let me uh, raise some things that I think uh, uh, you'll have to treat in your uh, project and maybe, and probably you've thought about you, many of them, but you know, because I cannot be sure, let me uh, spell them out. And the idea here is that any change in the data ecosystem might create new challenges, okay? If we move from one to the other, we need to think about the challenges that it creates. And so let me start uh, with some comments about, uh, that are based on the economics of data and incentive analysis. So the, the real question here is by changing the data ecosystem, how do we ensure that we create the best balance for users, okay, uh, um, in the market? So just a few comments here. First of all, we know about economies of scale and scope in data analysis that at least in some situations are beneficial to consumers, okay? Uh, one example might be, for example, the uh, Google Sanofi uh, joint venture, where they use information from many, many patients, online, uh, ongoing information about uh, um, 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 uh, uh, patients that, uh, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, sakirit, <laughs> sorry, lost diabetes. 
Diabetes, yeah, thank you. Diabetes patients, okay? Uh, and so they use that, uh, they use the aggregation in order to learn more about how best to treat the disease. Um, so um, um, how would that affect the ability? Um, because it creates a, a type of a barrier to entry uh, or a barrier to data uh, sharing. And you have to make sure that uh, this type of barrier um, 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 allows for data which is beneficial for us to go through and for other types not to go through, okay? And that might be in itself be a big challenge, especially in a world where you do not always know ahead of time what you would find in the data. Sometimes you find in the data a lot of things which are uh, um, uh, beneficial for users and consumers, but you do not know that ahead of time. Now I'm not, not I'm not saying don't understand me um, as saying that your solution is not good. I'm only saying these are things that have to be thought of. Okay. Second, maybe I mean one other thing to think about is does it really that, might it strengthen those that we don't want to strengthen? Because you know I have a paper that actually shows that the GDPR unintentionally strengthened the GAFAM firms, the, the, the large five, okay? And it was all based on good intentions. But what happens is it, cre it created barriers uh, that affected smaller firms or those that did not already have a lot of data. They affected them uh, in a way which created higher barriers for entry and collection of data, okay? So this is something that has to be thought of if you create higher barriers uh, um, to data collection. Third, how do you ensure neutrality of the uh, uh, platform, uh, um, of the intermediary um, in the long run? F fourth, how do you set the criteria for data sharing? What goes through, what doesn't go through? Is it, a, uh, is it based on joint welfare or is it each to its own. For example, if uh, it's beneficial for me to share certain type of data, but it's not good for Katrina to, to share that type of data, how do you choose? And what if I share and it affects Katrina, like you said, okay? I mean, how do you, what kind of criteria do you set for uh, uh, these uh, types of uh, um, uh, data sharing? Um, fifth point is intermediary power, okay? One thing to think about is competition law, my area, <laughs> or what used to be my area, now I'm more a law and, uh, and technology person. But uh, there are limitations on any sized firm, and that would be, uh, which is, not, I mean, the large firm. And if this intermediary is going to be very large, you have to think about also the implications on competition law. I mean, are there going to be any implications uh, uh, there? Um, another thing to think about, is the intermediary going to be also, can I apply it alone uh, for my own screen? Or does it only have to be a co-op? Okay, maybe it can be individual, okay? And then, you know, maybe the choice of the data that goes through is different. Okay, uh, this is um, um, uh, tort law, issues like who is responsible for the algorithm, uh, for harm created by, by the algorithm. And finally, will the intermediary um, lower levels of some services because of the, uh, uh, because of uh, these entry barriers? And one example that I can bring here is DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo is a, is a, is a, um, a search algorithm which protects privacy. Okay, but at least from what I've heard, um, the level of service that you can get is lower than you get in Google. So people have tried it. Many of them have gone back to Google because they say, okay, that's, um, you know, um, there's less data. And so we get less um, uh, 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 lower quality uh, services. So these are just a few comments. It's a great, great project, and I would love to hear more about it as you go along. Um, I'm just 
you know, um, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, all the things are tied because I really want this to work. It's for the benefit for all of us. Um, and uh, just a few comments and now I'm, you know, I, I want to leave time for questions. I'm going to be very short with uh, IFAT. So um, these cooperatives are, are uh, great. The, uh, the, I, I think that the um, um, uh, examples that you gave are very helpful in understanding the concept and why they might be uh, um, uh, um, uh, beneficial. I think an interesting uh, a question to think about is, does it work for all goods and services? Or are there goods and services that it wouldn't work for? And the challenge of how do you create efficient operation? And I think you need here a joint, uh, a, a clear joint goal, because otherwise um, it's problematic. So thank you all three. Thank you very much, Michal, for concisely bringing us all together to the point where we can open up the floor for questions from the audience. I have to disclose um, that I was also a, a, a part of a guinea pig, maybe a part of the <laughs> project of uh, Kobe and Katrina, where there were some workshops and we kind of uh, brainstormed about uh, about how to uh, to move it uh, forward and some of the concerns Michal raised were also raised by some uh, some members there um, but let's open it up for comments and questions from the audience about things to think about Ryan please thank you and thank you to all of the, the speakers and to Michal as well um, I've got a question for two questions quick questions the, the Kobe and for the Katrina um, but firstly, it's, it's so refreshing to hear this idea. I remember a few years ago reading a Shoshana Zuboff's book. Um, I, wrote a, I wrote a review of it for the, the Journal of Cyber Policy. And the big critique at the time was that it introduced us to surveillance capitalism, but it gave no hope for the future. It just talked about this apocalyptic future and there was absolutely no idea of any solution. And so to hear this solution or to hear these different solutions, both technological and social, is really... Uh, refreshing and hopeful and, and that uh, it, it made me feel happy for the future, hopeful, optimistic for the future. Uh, my two questions are um, whether or not you're creating a solution that the public may not want. I, I'm a public opinion scholar and all of the research seems to show that the public is aware that they're giving up valuable data and are willing to do that for the free service. They've weighed up the pros and the cons and they're still happy to, 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 to sacrifice their data for the service that they're getting. So you're gonna create this co-op and who is the public that's gonna sign up for it? Why are they gonna invest their time and energy and effort signing up for this co-op when they don't see that there's a problem to solve? We see that, but the wider public doesn't see them. So it's gonna to have to require some, uh, some PR element um, to, to frame the problem in, in terms that people understand. Um, that's going to make them invest the, the energy in, in solving that. Um, and my second question is, a, a lot of the, the technological solutions are premised on the idea that um, we can anonymize the data in some form, but the companies that get this anonymized data can still make uh, adequate use of it. Um, it, can, it can still feed the, the machine learning algorithms, they can still uh, use the data. And if, if that's the case, I mean, I, I believe you, I've got no reason not to believe you, of course, it, it just feels counterintuitive. Because um, if that's the case, why haven't some of the companies started to adopt this to a greater extent already? It feels like they could gain a real foot in the industry. I mean, a Apple is famous for saying that in, in their fight at the moment with Facebook say, um, that we protect people's data better and we're gonna stop Facebook from collecting data through our systems. Um, and, and, and they frame themselves as a privacy oriented company of the big five. So wh why haven't they already implemented all these solutions to say to people, we're protecting your data to, to an even greater extent, in which case there's no need for the co-op because they, they can use it as a commercial um, opportunity to differentiate themselves from you know, the evil Amazon, the evil Google, um, who, who don't have that brand of, of privacy. Okay. Um... 
would you, uh, Kobe, Katrina, and Yifat, would you care to respond to what Michal said, the questions Michal said and what Ryan said, or would you rather collect some uh, more questions from the, uh, we have some time, we have a, another 15 minutes, and I have a sense that uh, um, you, you can take your first shot at responding to what Michal said and Ryan said, then we can collect some more. Up to you on the format. I think there's a lot of interesting things have been raised. There's plenty to say already, but I'm, I don't want to... Let's go, Katrina. Let's, yeah. Go for okay. it. Because the, you, thank you, Michal. Thank you, Ifat. Um, really, really stimulating and interesting. I, Michal, you raised so many questions that I don't think I can touch all of them and without eating all of the time. So let me just uh, say a few things there. First of all, you, I mean, you raise some really interesting points that are crucial to the research. I mean, some of these issues are issues that have not been fully resolved. To what extent, you know, can you make sure that the, the co-op is designed in a fashion that it uh, encourages good uses of data or desirable uses of data and isn't placing um, barriers to sort of the desirable uses of data? Um, how exactly to sort of structure the sort of responsibility for harms that, that might come out? These, these sorts of questions I think are really important. Um, how to decide about uh, sort of the the complexities of the fact that my data affects others and what are, you know, what are my rights? Um, it's not a question specific to co-ops. It's something that we sort of as a society have to tease out in some sense, um, because the, the fact that our data is interconnected is, is fundamental. Um, and it's not something that's, that's a, just a co-ops issue. Uh, you mentioned uh, a spe one spe specific question was sort of, um, could co-ops be something that actually would be an individual tool? Um, could I have a co-op of one rather than a co-op of a million? To some extent, yes, I, a co-op could do some limited things for me as an individual, um, but it would miss a lot of the point. Um, so in bringing a large number of people together, a co-op is doing a few things simultaneously that individuals just can't do. So it's bringing together substantial economic power and political power um, to negotiate with the users of data which an individual just can't do on their own. It also is bringing a perspective on the incoming edge issues. So as an individual, I have no meaningful way to determine whether or not the information that I'm receiving is manipulating me, or if I'm being price discriminated, or I'm being discriminated against in job offers that I see, because I see my own data point. Unless we come together and have sort of a more collective view we can't really detect or intervene at that level. Um, so that's another reason we really want to come together. Kobe, maybe you wanted to say more things. I should yeah, talk so about Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take uh, other questions that were asked and try to understand. Uh, so let me take one from uh, Michal. Uh, oh, before that, actually, uh, let me thank you. I think pairing us with the fact is, was a great idea like for this session. So thanks for doing that. Um, and thanks, Michal, for the thoughtful questions. Um, uh, so you, you began with this question of what is this case about uh, diabetes and the fact that um, uh, uh, maybe, maybe we're going to lose some uh, of the utility in the data using uh, some of the techniques. Uh, and uh, actually, I'm not sure I... Uh, and, and then you spoke about creating high barriers for new participants and how do we decide which uh, sharings of the data we, we allow in this context? Uh, and so I think diabetes is a great example. This is a place where we can get a lot of benefits from, from data. It's really important. And as a society, we can make decisions that this is a goal that we are interested in promoting. And I think that co-ops could be part in, in making such societal decisions. Like and, and instead of focusing on the uh, maximizing profit of uh, the big platforms. Uh, this diabetes, I be believe, research in diabetes can also help maximize profit of some players. But but this, in some cases, this is not a goal. We may still be interested in, in researching it, and and, and the, their co-ops could be a tool in doing that. Now. Uh, you're right that in this research, there are a lot of questions of how to define exactly what we want to get from the research and what we don't want to get from the research. And a big problem is that, that many times we don't know ahead of time what exactly uh, we are interested or we will get from uh, after we look at the data. 
And I think here, this is a, a definitely a place uh, where there's a lot of room for research and actually uh, understanding how we define allowed or, and disallowed purposes in the use of data. And these are words that are used many times in the legal standards. Uh, and when I look at them, like uh, statistical purposes, research purposes, and so on, and when I look at them, I, I, I feel a bit baffled by what exactly do they mean by that? Can we uh, give that a technical meaning, uh, which is precise enough and, and, and is devoid of huge loopholes? And I'm afraid that currently we don't. So this is definitely part of this, uh, I think, legal technical search that we need to, uh, to do in order to see if we can find a uh, language that defines both from a legal and, or societal point of view what we're interested in and what we want to allow in the use of the data. And that it's also going to be technically from a technical point of view so that we're actually uh, able to make sure that our systems are allowing this kind of analysis. With respect to uh, 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 the loss of accuracy, I think there are chances actually that their cops will improve in some cases uh, accuracy and using data. In particular, currently data is held by big companies and it's siloed and the cop could have a more a general, if it, if it actually is uh, uh, representing a large uh, uh, population could have a, like a more general view of the data and could, could help us use data that is currently maybe some company is, is collecting a, a, a part of the data about me and other companies collecting another part of the data about me, but the, the interaction be, between these parts are something that the data corp may be able to see and the, the individual's companies don't. Um, let me maybe also uh, 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 address one of the questions of Ryan. Um, so can, can you remind me again? I think you had two questions there. Um, uh, this one was the discrepancy between what the public actually wants and yeah. the assumption about what the public actually wants. Right? That's right. Yeah, so, so I think I, I think this is definitely like the governance question here is, is a major question for which I think currently we have the least the least answers. How uh, does a co-op make decisions? Um, I think you were referring to the question that uh, people are aware that their data is being used maybe in ways that they are not that, that are not favorable for them, but still now they they uh, uh, persist in using the, the platforms. And I think from our point of view, from technical point of view, there is a question of creating the right incentives for individuals to participate. Mm -hmm. uh, th there is a fallacy that you're getting the services for free. Somebody is paying uh, for that profit of the big companies and it's quite clear who's, who's paying that that money, it's as a consumer, it's just that it's very indirect. And a co-op solution may make this more uh, transparent and may even be in a, my co-ops may be even in a position to make some benefit, some profit, some value for the co-op members. So actually money returning back to them in some of the cases, maybe not a, a huge amount of money, but something that is positive and can still, you know, make, make this, a more um, uh, like put the, the incentive right or make, make the story uh, better understood by, by the individuals so they see exactly what utility they are getting. But I agree that there is going to be probably a huge fight like what Yifat was uh, describing with the PR done by the big companies in order to uh, get misconceptions and, and uh, misinformation there. Before I bring, before I, I move to to Ifa, to might also want to say something, Ryan, to build on Kobe. Just think about the diabetes example that Michal brought. Suppose you, the co-op tells all the patients, "Look, you're gonna get whatever it is for free, or part of it for free, or whatever it is." All of a sudden, you see that you're gonna get something out of it, something t t tangential, not just I mean, not just something tangential, some, something that is actually real for your life you can get back from it 
yeah, they back out of the out of this uh, co-op, and then and then it may, it changes. It's a it's a game changer. Number one, number two, there is a fallacy of that the Kobe talked about about zero price. We have something in our brain when when it's zero, we think it's actually zero psychologically. We know that. Now a co-op can tell can 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 go to Google or somebody else and charge money for this, and then and then as soon as the as the participants in the co-op sees how much Google is willing to pay for it, they say, oh, you know what, maybe. Maybe it's different, uh, but if at. Oh, thanks. Um, well, first of all, from Khal, of course, not everything needs to be a co-op, uh, but uh, I think that the, the uh, uh, what important is to realize that uh, the technology is not as complicated as the companies would like us to believe, uh, and that we can create alternatives that are owned by people. But I would like to address the, uh, uh, um, the decision to, uh, uh, which is asked by, by Rang, and, and maybe the, the health uh, issues are very, um, very interesting in that, uh, uh, for, for that matter. Uh, I remember when I was uh, first introduced to MeData, it's a, a health data cooperative. It was started in Switzerland many, many years. Well, I think I heard about it first like seven years ago. Um, um, so, Actually, it's more data that you put on a collective platform because our personal data, our personal health data should or well, not supposed to be uh, uh, used in uh, any uh, public sphere. It's, it's, uh, uh, sometimes it, uh, it uh, eventually goes there, but it's not supposed to. Um, so, and it's not supposed to because uh, uh, we don't want it to be used for um, uh, uh, companies that will use it for their own uh, uh, interests and not for public interests. And I think that to put uh, 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 um, health data for public use for uh, promoting uh, medication and vaccines, and blah, blah, uh, that's within the public interest. Uh, but the only way uh, we as individuals would allow uh, information, personal information to be put somewhere is if we can be sure that it, we, uh, uh, it won't be used against us or uh, uh, for other interests. Uh, and I think that um, um, as time passes, people uh, more and more realize what dangers hold uh, uh, within the uh, 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 these big companies that can use uh, uh, the data? Uh, and as I already mentioned, we see the huge crisis uh, uh, these days with the with the COVID nineteen vaccine. And uh, Ryan, I think that uh, 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 there the, there is a process. Uh, I think you're right that until recently, or even now, in most cases, okay, so we use the platform, it doesn't cost us anything, and so they collect the data. But we starting, I think the public starting to realize the dangers of this uh, data collect, uh, uh, collection. And uh, as time will pass, and I hope we'll get more uh, awareness, then uh, people would want uh, to use alternatives. That's a great optimistic way to end our meeting. I'm not so sure it actually in practice will happen because of reasons Katrina talked about. We're being tailored into a certain echo chamber, which is governed by interest we're not fully sure of. So maybe it's a, it's a bit murkier on to what extent should we trust at any given point individual choice on that. So it becomes really complex. But, but I, 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 you know, I think Kobe is right. It is a question of, of governance. And if we can, uh, and, and we can think of how it should operate and how, what kind of democratic processes should be there and how transparent they are, then we can get the, uh, uh, the public trust. Let's agree that the issue of governance is central because it takes time to govern all those decisions. And now it is time, eight o'clock, for us to conclude our, our uh, session. So time is, is one of the major uh, uh, um, quantities under the uh, scarcity. And with that uh, in mind, 
I want to thank you all for this wonderful uh, uh, exchange. I want to apologize for all those who wanted to ask questions but didn't have a time, the time to do that. Hopefully there will be continuations on this wonderful uh, project on co-ops generally, data co-ops, pl platform co-ops, and, and ways to think together about platform co-ops and data co-ops, how to, to think about this, this uh, issue together. Um, I uh, would like to welcome uh, uh, you to our next, or invite you, sorry, to our next uh, uh, meeting, which is going to be the last one for this term, which is going to talk about quantum. We're going to issue, we're going to address the issue of quantum and how to think about quantum. Uh, we're going to be, uh, uh, so Chris Hofnagel from Berkeley and our very own Dr. Tal David, who chairs the Israeli initiative on quantum by the government. Uh, they're going to address the uh, law technology and policy making in quantum so thank you very much good night and see you all in our next in our next uh, meeting uh, uh, i'm i'm calling this uh, uh, off now thank you thank you very Thanks much everyone. Thank you.